In this video, we're going to look at the data for the Phillips curve. So we'll, we'll take a quick look at the previous data we looked at for the United States, which was 1900 to 1960. Uh, then we'll look at the data from the 1960s specifically, and then we'll look at the 1970s. And we'll see that while the relationship seemed to be quite strong between unemployment and the inflation rate in the 1960s, it all fell apart in the 1970s. And so then what we're going to do is we're going to talk about why that is and a way to adjust uh, the Phillips curve um, as it was originally proposed in order to um, get a more nuanced view of it and actually look for it again in the data. And we'll see that there is, it does come back um, if we make some changes, but it's important uh, to think about the role of expectations. And this was actually one of the uh, maybe a few times that economists got something right uh, beforehand in terms of prediction. Um, so Edmund Phelps and, and Francesco Modigliani both said in the late 1960s that the Phillips curve uh, was somewhat illusory because it didn't take into account people's expectations. And so as soon as people's expectations changed, the relationship between unemployment and inflation changed. Now, what do we mean by expectations? Well, what it's what's going to be important is how much expected inflation is, right? Um, so, you know, if we look at sort of our original equation, we had this piece of expected inflation in there, but that really wasn't part of the original Phillips curve, right? And so if the original Phillips curve um, didn't have expectations in there, we can either think of uh, expected inflation as zero or as some fixed number. And so in that case, we don't have to worry about it, right? It's just, you know, fixed, it's gone, it's not changing, and we can focus on uh, the unemployment rate, right? That's the main variable of interest. Um, and so we really did see it in the 1960s, but um, in the 1960s, what we saw is that actually inflation started to increase throughout the decade. And so people's expectations increased, right? And this is one of the reasons that economics is so complicated is that you're dealing with human beings and human beings change their behavior. And so something that was true in the data over the last 20, 30, 40 years might not be true in the data going forward. So if we take a quick look at the graph that we already looked at in the last video um, of the relationship between the unemployment rate and inflation um, in the United States between 1900 and 1960, we can see that there were a lot of years of deflation, right? And average inflation, you know, might have been positive, probably was positive, but there were plenty of years where it was negative, and so it was probably pretty close to zero. Um, and that's actually was even more true in the data that Phillips uh, was looking at. And a lot of, I think, what's important to remember is that for basically up until uh, the 1930s, the United States and most other uh, economies were on the gold standard, right? And so with the gold standard, you can't really change the money supply uh, based on macroeconomic conditions, right? Because the, the money has to be backed by a certain amount of gold. And so in those situations, what you get are some years of inflation uh, when the economy is booming and some years of deflation where the price level is going down uh, in years of recession or depression, right? We had a lot of years of uh, deflation in the 1930s during the Great Depression, but we even had plenty of years of deflation um, in uh, other years as well. So now we go, so now we have this idea of the Phillips curve that came out in the 50s. We are going to start using it for Fed policy to think about the trade-off between unemployment and inflation. And here's what we got in uh, the 1960s. So this data is actually 1948 through 1969, uh, but you can see the diamonds here are uh, the 1960s. And so 1961, we start off with fairly high unemployment, but low inflation, and then we move as the Fed tries to take advantage of this relationship, we move to lower uh, unemployment, but higher inflation. So that by 1969, inflation is over 5%. And, you know, it's been increasing since 1961, really, but it's definitely been increasing since 1965, right? You could say it's more or less stable between 1961 and 1965. So we've got this relationship where 
the Fed's trying to keep the unemployment rate low uh, through sort of easy monetary policy. Inflation is increasing. Remember, this is pre-oil um, crises. And so people are like, huh, well, what do we think inflation's going to be, you know, in the future? And what we see is in, the, you know, the 1970s, um, this actually graphs data from the 1970s all the way to 2010, is that this relationship between the unemployment rate on uh, the horizontal axis and the inflation rate on uh, the vertical axis basically falls apart, right? There's no relationship here. If we measured the R squared in this data, it would be very close to zero. Um, and you can see there are a couple things that are important, right? Is inflation is definitely higher than it was in that sort of 1900 to 1960 data. We've only had one year of deflation and that was actually during the financial crisis. This is, uh, I think, 2009. Um, and really, there's no, there's no relationship, right? We had these periods of high inflation in the late 70s and early 80s. And since then, you know, in the 90s, we've had fairly low inflation. Um, 2000s, uh, you know, over the last 20 years, you know, we could add to this graph and, and put in the last 10 years, uh, still fairly low inflation, still fairly um, not dependent on the unemployment rate. So in order to figure this out, we have to add expectations back in, right? And we have to think about, all right, well, how do people form their inflationary expectations? And the way we're going to do that is we're going to think mostly about adaptive expectations. And so with adaptive expectations, people uh, will expect higher inflation in the future if there was higher inflation in the past. So if I'm thinking about, okay, well, what is inflation going to be in 2021? I might have some idea of what inflation would be in a normal year, right? We can call that pi bar. But I'm also going to look at 2020, right? Was inflation high or low in 2020? Now, obviously, 2020 was a crazy year with the pandemic. And so uh, inflation was weird. Um, overall, it was low, but we had some prices going up and some prices going down. But looking back is a reasonable way for human beings to form expectations. And so we're going to say, all right, expected inflation in year T is going to be 1 minus theta times pi bar. That's just sort of like what we think inflation will be in a normal year, plus theta times pi to T minus 1, so last year's inflation. So we can think about a couple examples, right? When theta equals 0, then inflation is just equal to pi bar, right, because that becomes the, all of the expected inflation, plus m plus z minus alpha ut. Um, when theta is greater than zero, we have a fairly complex um, Phillips curve, where we have this theta bar term times one minus theta, and then we have this theta term times last year's inflation. And the easiest one that's going to sort of be useful is when theta equals one, where we have purely adaptive expectations. And basically, we expect it, this year's inflation to be the same as last year's inflation. And the nice thing about this is it's simple. We can look at look for it in the data. Um, and it actually, we, we do see somewhat of a relationship. Now, I don't think we necessarily want to think that people have completely adaptive expectations and that theta is equal to one. But I think there is some evidence that, you know, theta is positive. Uh, and that people do look to the past in order to form uh, their future inflationary expectations. So what does that give us? Well, if we move inflationary expectations, which now are just equal to pi t minus 1, last year's inflation, over to the left-hand side of our equation, then we get pi t minus pi t minus 1, that's just the change in inflation, is equal to m plus z, that's a constant, minus alpha times ut. So now, instead of inflation on the left-hand side, we have the change in inflation on the left-hand side. And that is really important, right? That's a key difference. Um, and then we have a constant, and then we have a slope times ut. We have a nice linear relationship in our Phillips curve. And so we can take that to the data and look to see if we have that uh, relationship in the data. And the answer is, mm, yeah. Right? It looks as good as the Phillips curve looked originally, I would say. Um, so now, despite the fact that they didn't really label the uh, vertical axis well in this graph that says inflation, this is change in inflation. Um, we have, so we have change in inflation. So if it's positive, inflation is going up. 
And if it's negative, inflation is going down, but not necessarily negative, right? We, it's just disinflation rather than deflation. And then we still have the unemployment rate on the horizontal axis. Um, I'd say there's some argument whether or not we could think about whether the change in the unemployment rate is more important than the level of the unemployment rate. But I think we don't really get that much better of a fit um, using the change in the unemployment rate. So here we have the best fit line here. So what does this say? It says y, our y variable is the change in inflation, is equal to minus 0.5x plus 3%. So let's think about what that means. So that means that when uh, x is 0, right? So if our unemployment rate was 0, we would have an inflation rate of 3%. Um, that's not actually, or a change in inflation of 3%. Um, and it means that when the unemployment rate goes down by one percentage point, inflation goes down by half a percentage point. And when inflation goes uh, up by one percentage point, uh, inflation would go down by half a percentage point. So we have this negative relationship. And what you can see is that there's, there's data over here um, in you know, the high unemployment rate with the disinflation and there's some data over here, but there are outliers, right? There's a couple points up here where we have high um, unemployment, but inflation actually increases. Uh, there's a few places over here where we have low unemployment um, and inflation uh, decreases. So it's not a perfect relationship, right? And the fact is that with macroeconomic data, we never get a perfect relationship. Um, but our, you know, there is some relationship, right? We wouldn't necessarily say that, you know, this data says there's no relationship between these two variables. So we call this equation, right? So this is just that um, line uh, in sort of y equals mx plus b form, right? The change in inflation is equal to 3% minus 0.5 ut. And maybe we should note that that 3%, it doesn't look like 3% in this graph, but that's because our unemployment rate doesn't go all the way to zero. Right, they ended at four because that's the lowest the unemployment rate was uh, in this data set. Um, so we call this the modified Phillips curve or the expectations augmented Phillips curve. Um, I don't really hear the term accelerationist Phillips curve necessarily, but the reason that you know you might call it the accelerationist Phillips curve is the idea that um, if you try to keep unemployment too low, then inflation is just going to keep increasing. And that's the key takeaway here is that if you have a really tight labor market for a long time, you'll get higher and higher inflation. Um, <laughs> does that agree with the data? Well, maybe, maybe not, right? We've had fairly low unemployment um, in you know the last 20 years outside of obviously the financial crisis and uh, the COVID pandemic. And it hasn't seemed to really give us too much higher inflation. Uh, but we'll look at some more of the data as well. Um, and then sometimes we call that Phillips curve without expected inflation, the original Phillips curve, uh, just to separate the two.